my name is Marty, and I'm an alcoholic. And I remember some, oh, maybe 15, 20 years ago, when I was going to speak at a meeting in New York, which I did fairly frequently when I wasn't traveling, and they said, uh, don't forget you have to qualify. And I said, what's that? <laughs> and they said, well, that's the way we do it now. You have to, before you can say anything at all, you have to qualify. Well, all I meant by qualify, I discovered, was that you couldn't just launch into uh, a little tiny bit about your drinking career and then take off into uh, the philosophical clouds uh, or your opinion of AA uh, or techniques that could be used in AA. Uh, that they were looking for a very personal story and that they didn't want anybody up there that didn't have the right to speak there. And I guess if you went in and said that, uh, well, you had a little trouble with alcohol and uh, you heard about this thing and it sounded awfully good and you understood that they used a word you didn't like very much, but you were perfectly willing to say you were an alcoholic just to get to go. <laughs> That would not be a qualification. They were busy making us exclusive, <laughs> which we have been from the beginning by our very nature. At any rate, that means if I follow that pattern, and I always thought it was a pretty good one, that I would have to start, as I had many time over the years, with at least a little something about my drinking history. It didn't begin terribly early. I'd lived in a house where a uh, home where uh, drinking was the norm. My mother had two cocktails before dinner all the days of her life and complained bitterly if she didn't get them. And she loved something, you remember the days when they shook the cocktails and the shaker. She loved the dividend. I saw her kite once in all those years, little bit kiddie. Uh, we never let her forget it because she was reading the newspaper upside down. <laughs> <laughs> but all I'm really saying is that uh, having drinks served in the house was the order of the day. In fact, it was enough. And I had my first drinks when I was very small at such events as Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner or New Year's dinner where uh, I had a little glass of creme de menthe at the end with a little tiny straw in it. Or occasionally at Sunday night, Sunday night supper at my grandparents, I would have a little tiny glass of beer. I love that. I like both of them. But that was it. And it's not until many years later, actually, I think it was the year I was 17, did I ever really uh, have a drink in a serious manner? You no, know, did I really take a drink? And what had happened was that uh, while I had been off in California recovering from tuberculosis, and having no social life at all, and it took me three years to get through that. And then coming back and going away to boarding school, because I always had to be in healthy climates. So uh, when I came east, I went to a place that was in uh, Lake Placid in the spring and fall in Miami Beach in the winter. And Miami Beach, incidentally, was a desert. There was nobody else on the beach but us. It's hard to believe. That just tells you how old I am. <laughs> I kind of missed out on things that were going on and one of the things that had been going on was the coming of prohibition and I gather it had changed things quite a lot uh, drinking had become a very very part, important part of anybody's social life whatever age they were and uh, if you didn't drink you just didn't get dates and if the boy that asked you didn't have a big enough flask, he didn't get your date. 
that seemed quite normal to me because that was the way I found it and uh, I, nobody had to force me. I liked it. I made a great discovery. I discovered that from being, partly from this three years of semi-isolation, I think, and, uh, not meeting any strange people at that during that whole period, I was extremely shy and uh, it's hard to believe, tongue-tied. <laughs> I know, I went out on a couple of dates and they never asked me again because I never opened my mouth. <laughs> I found that with one or two or three drinks, and quite quickly I discovered it was more likely three, it untied my tongue and I could talk. Uh, I wasn't a bit afraid of the strangers I was going to meet in the course of the evening or the event, whatever it was. Uh, I felt very comfortable and very at home, and I began to have a wonderful time. Well, even then I described it as being sheer magic. Now, it never occurred to me that it wasn't that for everybody. Many, many, many years later that I learned that was an unusual reaction and that it was uh, reserved for those of us that were going to join this exclusive club one day <laughs> if we lived long enough. That normal drinkers don't have that reaction. The fact that we do, in my opinion, makes us alcoholics from that moment. In other words, we start out that way. I had one other thing that I discovered very early and that it never occurred to me was different. I had an infinite capacity. I could think anybody and everybody under the table. <coughs> There's no trouble at all. I never showed it. I never showed any signs of it. I never got thick speech or rubber legs. I always drove the car home with everybody else in it because they wouldn't drive with anybody else. And I always remembered everything that went on. My phone rang all morning about what happened the night before and what I said and what I did. Not me. I could tell then. And I never had a hangover. Well, of course, for many years I said that I had had Ten years of beautiful social drink uh, before I became an alcoholic. And uh, I know quite a lot of you have read Primer, and I described that in Primer, not in those words exactly, but during that time I was having all of those hidden symptoms that don't show on the outside. But that if you really take that kind of a history, and if you're that kind of honest with yourself about it, if you're that interested, you will find you probably had two, at least many two. I had every one of them. And uh, I think I was an alcoholic from the moment I touched alcohol. I had no idea, incidentally, that my father was an alcoholic. There was no imitation about it or... <coughs> knowledge of its existence in the family. My mother concealed it very well. Uh, it didn't affect <coughs> his uh, work life. His, he had a very high position or uh, his financial life until many years later. I never knew that. Didn't know anything about it. As far as I was concerned, I had a perfectly lovely childhood, you know, and I enjoyed it. And uh, I didn't particularly like the... Uh, the period I spent in bed with the TV, but the rest of it was just standing. And there were even good things about that, too. Things I liked and enjoyed. And I say this because once upon a time, I thought that I was pretty typical. And uh, I heard enough stories like my own to know that there were many like me. And there were many people who had very similar patterns of the, of the onset and the uh, taking hold of alcoholism. And enough so that I could write that book 
and have it accepted not only as a classic of the uh, descriptive books of alcoholism, but a book that uh, revealed a lot of alcoholics to themselves and brought them to help. But I've been learning in more recent years that that isn't always the way it is. Uh, I heard a story just night before last at the meeting I went to, and I've heard two of them from somebody sitting right here in this seat of a very different kind of drinking, of uh, men like Al. I can't remember, remember Al. Uh, and another one named John, who was a pipe fitter. And, uh, and there's still a third. And they all told the same kind of story. Now, they were, they were different. They not only loved to drink, that was all they loved to do. And they loved to drink, and the, they loved the taste, and that was all they wanted, and they wanted more and more and more and more of it, and there wasn't any other life at all. And it, mine wasn't like that. I had a wonderful life. And that first ten years before I paid any price for it, I enjoyed all kinds of things. And I traveled a lot, and my interests were broad. And the, the, since the drink didn't affect me that way, I didn't lose interest in everything else. That was until after I had turned the corner uh, and and the drink had got me in real trouble. Uh, that's when it took over my life, and uh, I'd had ten good years of drinking before that. And yet, I think those ten years of drinking were alcoholic drinking, now that I look back. Uh, I do not think it is normal. This is one of the reasons I personally am convinced that there is a physiological basis to alcoholism. I don't deny that there's also a, an emotional basis, a mental basis, a social basis, and a spiritual basis. All those factors are there. But certainly my body had an abnormal reaction to alcohol from the first time I put alcohol in. And it was my body for that. And that was the only thing that was affected at that time. And uh, I think that's also true of an awful lot of people, and I just hope I live long enough <coughs> to find out what it is. I'm dying to know. And furthermore, I, the only thing that worries me, it might put us out of business. <laughs> 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 not that they'd find a cure. I, I don't, that might or might not be possible, <coughs> but it put us out of business because it would promptly eliminate the stigma if we had a physical disease, we'd have a disease and there'd be no question about it and it would no longer be a moral question. And we wouldn't be weaklings anymore. And we wouldn't have to hide. We wouldn't have to be anonymous. Uh, and a whole lot of things that have made us what we are might change. So, well, maybe it's just as well we don't find it out. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but I would, for my personal satisfaction, I really would like to know. That ten years was uh, was a ball. It was great. I lived in different parts of this country. I went abroad to live. And in fact, I was living abroad. Well, I had been for some years. In the year when my drinking changed. And uh, I find that interesting to look back on, too, because it was, it was such a clear pattern. Uh, in the course of the year that I was 27, I had first my first blackout. I had recently had a fall, a quite legitimate fall, uh, not a drunken. Oh, I was drinking the way I usually did, but that wasn't drunken. It didn't look it or feel it. But anyway, I'd had a fall and hit my head on the banister of a railing. I mean, went into a house I hadn't been in before, and it was built on the side of the Thames River. This was in London. And it, nobody thought to warn me that the steps went right down. You know, you stepped in the door, and, you went, and I went right down. And uh, I went to a doctor because I thought I had a concussion. I couldn't remember anything about the evening. And he said, well, I had had a concussion. It was not too severe, and if I just didn't drink for a few days and <coughs> had plenty of rest, it, I'd be fine. So I didn't drink for a few days. 
Incidentally, I was always able to do that, even at the terminal end of my illness, to go for a few days. And sure enough, I was all right again. I would never have thought of it again, excepting about three weeks later it happened again, without a fall. And then it began to happen quite often, without a fall. <coughs> In other words, I had started blackouts, and I found them very frightening. And I couldn't understand what they were. And I talked to my doctor about it. I had a quite remarkable doctor. Everyone I knew went to in London, and a woman doctor. She didn't know what it was. I had no idea what just happened. Not long after that, I woke up one morning and I practically said to the doctor, I was so sick. I didn't wake up sick. I was sick all day. I had a hangover. <laughs> I knew right then that it ought to have a different name. This was not what my friends described as hangovers. I take the kind we have when we finally get them, or what I call epic. <laughs> They're monstrous. You, know, you really wish you were dead. And it was about that time that I discovered from another good friend that all my friends were good drinkers. I didn't know any that weren't, didn't want to, uh, that a hair of the dog really did help. And that's when I found that uh, if I had a pint under the bed, I could get up. Otherwise, I couldn't. Well, there were a few other things besides that, but uh, that's enough to describe the extreme change <coughs> in the way I drank and what drinking did to me. And uh, I still could drink a great deal without getting sloppy. But I began to get rubber legs occasionally. I never did get the thick speech. And I certainly got the hangovers, and I certainly got the blackouts. And from then on, it was not a ball. I didn't, didn't like this very much. And I began making changes in things I did. Decided to change where I, what I did and where I worked and where I lived and went out to run a hotel in the country. And in other words, the geographical changes that we make in our efforts to run away from this terrible thing but the, uh, the awful discovery we make that when we run away we take ourselves with us and that but, oh I'll tell you one story about that I'm not going to tell you too many drinking stories just enough to let you know it was real I was in this little town it's a very beautiful town in England called Broadway and two young men that I knew had bought the inn at the foot of this picture book street on which nothing had been built since Jacobean days. Nothing was permitted to be built. So it was perfect. And they had added on to the back so that it had a swimming pool and it had Simmons beds and it had all, all, all the comforts of, of America for tourists. But uh, <clears throat> the front was just this beautiful Jacobean house. And there were two things about that, living in that house. Uh, they wanted to go to Madeira for the winter, and I used to go, quite a lot of people I knew went there for the weekend, although it was a long, long way from London. It was a lovely place to go, and we always had a lot of fun. And they had good horses up there, and those of us that liked to ride to hunt could do that, too, go up for a few days and get, get a horse and ride. <coughs> All of that was great. And uh, they asked me if I wouldn't like to come and run the hotel for at least three months. And I said, maybe longer if they want to stay longer. I thought, now that's exactly the kind of change I'd make. That's a complete change for everything. I was in the photography business in London, uh, which was hustle and bustle. And uh, this would be quiet, Nice and easy, and, and furthermore, they didn't have a license. 
There's no bar in the chest. People had to bring their own liquor. And there were a lot of uh, semi-permanent guests because they were there for the hunting season and they had their own liquor on the own table. Well, I had arrived already at the point where uh, they would complain to me about the fact that they thought their liquor was disappearing and I would fire a waiter. <laughs> and uh, another thing I discovered was that all the good chefs were drunks. And uh, so I'd get the best one, and he would order his cooking sherry by the five gallon keg. <laughs> and uh, he and I would have a lovely time in the back of the kitchen while we planned the menus over the cooking sherry. <laughs> And the only trouble with that was that when he reached a certain point, he'd go around with his carving knife, and it was a little bit nerve-wracking. <laughs> but he scared enough of the other servants that I had to get rid of him and find another one. <laughs> so there were things like that that were going on, and the other thing was that I had already learned I couldn't afford to keep a bottle in my room. It was so awful to go to bed with your supply all set and to wake up in the morning and find an empty bottle. <laughs> Happened all the time. Anybody else ever had that? <laughs> oh, that's misery. So I didn't have one. And then I discovered that uh, I had a room, a great big room up the top of this house under a peak. It was beautiful. But next to it was a, was a long attic. And those two boys had experimented all year making dandelion wine and raspberry wine and elderberry wine. And they, they didn't know how to make wine. But they had stacks of it, pyramids of this wine they'd made that was aging up in there. And uh, of course, I couldn't, there was nothing open. I couldn't go out in the middle of the night when I woke and found the empty bottle. Uh, I began uh, raiding the attic and taking a bottle of wine and putting the empty one at the bottom of the pyramid, you know, and the others at the top. It was terrible stuff. Ooh. I think I went rather fast after uh, after I turned my corner to some of the the less pleasant aspects of. Of alcoholism. Pretty soon they came back and uh, uh, began to hear things and uh, told me that it sounded to them as if I was drinking too much, but nobody could tell me that. So uh, I went back to London in a high dudgeon and went back to the photography business where I spent a great deal of time in the dark room uh, because I could keep my supplies in there. And I could still manage to do quite a lot with photographs in spite of it. And that went along dandy until uh, there was a big party for a lot of Americans, and it was a Fourth of July party. And I disappeared early, shortly after we arrived. I wasn't feeling very well, and uh, I couldn't be found. And pretty soon I was found, and I was found on the terrace in pieces. And I had fractured my leg up near the hip, and I fractured my jaw on both sides, and I knocked out all my lower teeth, and I bit the sides off my tongue, and here we were in a little town way off in nowhere. And I had to stay in that hospital just the way I was uh, until I could be got into the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in London. And I was in considerable pain. So when the day came, which was I think about five days after the accident, they incidentally did not think it was an accident. I don't either. It was not an easy window to fall out of. And uh, I was in that state of mind a good deal of the time by then anyway. So they filled me full of heroin, seems through the trip. That's my one and only experience with it. And, and don't try it. It's beautiful. <laughs> I was in an ambulance and I was raised up quite high and it was remember 4th of July weekend 
It was July on a beautiful summer day in the English countryside in which there is no winter. And I lay there, just looking out the windows in this beautiful glow that I was in. And that is a, a, a piece of beauty I have in my memory that I don't deserve. <laughs> It was the loveliest trip I've ever taken my whole life. <laughs> However, I spent six months in the hospital in London uh, with my leg had shortened three inches, so it had to have a pin through the bone and 80 pounds attached to it and a Rube Goldberg construction on the bed, and I was practically upside down to pull it back before it could heal. Uh, and I'll tell you one more bit of that. That's when I began to think about what I was going to do. But I got out there and I decided that uh, possibly I had better go back home. That I seemed to be getting into real trouble. And I was, after all, in a foreign country. And uh, if I was going to be in real trouble and have to be locked up somewhere, which I was beginning to suspect, I'd better get home to America. And... Uh, my kind friends had told the uh, officials in the hospital when they brought me in that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't live without alcohol. I had to have a drink. And, and the innocent doctors believed it. <laughs> All they said was, well, we can't afford to supply it. You'll have to bring it in to her. We'll see she gets it. So I got, I can't remember what it was, but it was more than two ounces. I think I got four ounces every morning and four ounces every night. And uh, the, this hospital was orthopedic where uh, girls could start training to be nurses at 17 in an orthopedic hospital. They couldn't start till 18 in a regular hospital. And uh, here were all these 17-year-old kids, and I was far the youngest person on the ward. I was on a ward, a big one. And uh, so they liked me, and they realized I would like my drinks. And they thought that was only normal because I was in such pain and so uncomfortable all the time. Uh, they didn't have much in the way of drugs, incidentally, in that hospital either. So that the pain was quite great. And they, uh, they brought me my liquor in a clear glass like that. And then they had a china pitcher <coughs> for a chaser. That was water. Only was <laughs> and since my uh, all my friends brought liquor instead of uh, books or flowers or anything <laughs> <laughs> I had a very sizable cellar they could go on. <laughs> and I didn't really suffer too much that six months and eventually I came out of there and the one little nurse that had been on at night and I'd gotten to know very well took me to her home in the north of Scotland where I learned to walk in a brace. And eventually with just a cane and eventually without even a limp. So that uh, I have a lot of these scars that I gained from men that I suppose, I, you know, when you get older, they tell you that uh, you begin to feel all the aches and pains of the breaks and damages you did to yourself when you were young. And I do. <laughs> it's true. And I did an awful lot of them. But up there in Scotland, I thought, I, I really have to go home. And I think I'd better make some plans about what I'm going to do. And I think I'd better stop drinking. And uh, I couldn't drink up there, at least not very much, uh, until I went to a few of their rare parties that they had occasionally on weekends where they... They did their Scotch dances, and I found I was quite good at that. And uh, these were Highland Scots, and they make terrible noises when they dance. <laughs> so I spent an awful lot of time on a ranch in New Mexico, and I knew how to do cowboy yells, and that was great. That fit just perfect. <laughs> and they loved to read Western stories, so my first experience in speaking was telling them about life in the West. And, uh, well, I had a nice time. They're, they're very remarkable people, those Scotch people. I love them. And I learned a little Gaelic because the older ones didn't even speak English. <coughs> it, was, it was 
was a strange and remarkable life. And I paid my way by being a rabbit trapper, believe it or not. Because the husband of the little nurse, whom I had persuaded her to marry instead of going on nursing, and uh, his name was Skinner, and it was Skinner on purpose, because that was the business he was in. He trapped rabbits. <coughs> and uh, rabbits are the major meat in the big towns in England. And uh, he'd come into London sometimes and take us to dinner, and he'd say, you know, you think you're eating chicken, you aren't, you're eating rabbit. <laughs> Rabbit's better than chicken, I discovered. Anyway, it was an experience. And I finally managed and connived and corresponded and gathered together enough money to get a ticket. And I came back to America. Largely because I'd read a book. A book had come out by a man named William Seabrook called Asylum. And I had known Willie Seabrook. I used to drink with Willie Seabrook. And we drank very much the same. And he apparently, according to this book, had gone to a hospital and he described being wrapped in wet sheets and put in running water and I don't know, all kinds of things. And he was there for a long, long time and when he came out, he could drink. So I wanted to go home and find Willie Seabrook. <laughs> and go to that hospital and come home and do the same thing. And I came home. And I wasn't going to drink on the boat. And I give you three guesses. I didn't see the New York skyline. I didn't see the Statue of Liberty. I didn't know that we had landed. I was the last person off the boat and I was carried off. And that's how I returned after seven years. And I was in what I call now the terminal stages of alcoholism by then. And I don't remember drawing a sober breath in the next year in New York. My sister was waiting, and I shared an apartment with her and a friend of hers. They didn't know what to do with me. And obviously I was not able to work. And every now and then I'd go... I I was convinced by then that that, that I was insane. I couldn't understand this kind of behavior, which to me wasn't like me. It wasn't the way I wanted to be. It wasn't the way I felt. And uh, Yet I couldn't seem to do anything about it. And I couldn't think of anything in the times when I did think about it, which was a lot, that I had actually set out to do with all my heart and soul that I hadn't been able to do. And here, for it, it all in all, a total of five years, I was setting out to control my drinking with everything I had, and I couldn't do it. Now, this is crazy. The second step tells us. But I didn't know that. And I couldn't understand it. And it it scared me to death. And I didn't know what kind of... I didn't know much about insanity anyway, except it was awful. And every one of the doctors that I went to, when I explained why I thought I was insane, I told them about the crazy things that happened with my drinking. It was always associated with that. And they... They uh, also, uh, I was not a rich woman. They weren't gaining a regular patient they'd have for a long while. <laughs> they kept her alive. There were a lot of those doctors around, but I didn't get to them. But they wouldn't touch me. Uh, they would always say, no, it's, I'm afraid there's not very much we can do for you. And I said, well, what is it? Well, we're not quite sure. No one would tell me what it was that was wrong. And I thought it was something so awful they couldn't bring themselves to tell me. And it's uh, it's a terrible thing to live with. These kind of thoughts and feelings about yourself. I kept trying and then 
when I would give up and he would usher me out, uh, I would head for the nearest bar. I always had a little money, and I'd, I'd order three double martinis and get them down as fast as I could to forget what he just told me. I couldn't stand it. And uh, then I'd wait quite a while before I was driven to try another one. And I didn't pick them out of the phone book. I got them through people I knew or had known in the past or had met so that they were not unknown quantities. And, you know, many years later, I met quite a few of those men and I got into this work. And they used to say to me, you know, Marty, we we really have to apologize to you. We shouldn't perhaps have treated you that way, but it would have been unfair to take you on as a patient because we didn't know what to do with you. And they didn't. And most of them still don't. And that's where we come in here. But at any rate, I got nowhere until I was given a present to go and see a man who's the daughter of this family whom I knew. Uh, she was an extraordinary alcoholic. She, she'd sit still. She never moved. She'd get in and she'd settle in a chair and... Uh, she would just sit like this and the only motion she made all evening <laughs> and sometimes she passed out and you just had to cover her up and leave her there and sometimes you could walk her home which was across the street <laughs> she was a very nice human being and I was trying not to drink not doing very well, but still I was trying. She was awfully impressed that I was trying, and she said, and she knew I was going to see these doctors, various doctors, getting nowhere, and she said, you know, if you would accept it, Marty, I'd like to give you a Christmas present. She said, uh, we have a doctor, he's practically the family doctor, and he was indeed. The family of alcoholics with a good Irish name, and lots and lots and lots of money, and lots and lots and lots of alcoholics. And I went to see him, and he was the most remarkable man, very remarkable man. He was, the, uh, he was a neurologist and a, psycho a psychiatrist, and the head of neurology at Cornell. He gave me two and a half hours, and he did not say that he couldn't touch me. What he said to me was, and I'd just like people to remember that, especially the newer ones, <laughs> In my experience, people like you have one chance in a hundred. You want to get well so badly, I'm going to take a chance on your being that one. Now, the only place I can put you, you're broke, is Bellevue Hospital. Not in the psychiatric section, because you don't belong there. You're not insane. Whatever you think, you're not insane. The neurological section, that's my part of the hospital. I run that section. I go there nearly every day. And I'll see you there. Well, I would have gone anywhere that he told me to. I thought he was, I really thought he was, I always did think he was simply terrific. One of the very remarkable men that have lived. And in case some of you have ever heard his name, it was Foster Kennedy. Great, great man. And he gave, that was my start. That was my beginning. I spent seven months in Bellevue. And I kept insisting that that wasn't enough. That I had to have treatment for whatever this was that was wrong in my head, whatever he chose to call it. He didn't call it anything. Nobody ever called it anything. The word alcoholism and the word alcoholic were not in use in the 30s. It was people like you. And he got me into a private place because of who he was and his influence, really. In Greenwich, a place called Blythe. And I can tell you to go from the neurological ward in the old building in Bellevue to... <laughs> Greenwich, which the grounds were very similar to Silver Hill, except they were 500 acres. 
and the main house had been Boss Tweedy's house with great columns down the front and it was something. I couldn't believe it, you know. And I was there for 15 months. And the medical director was my psychiatrist. And in those days, you were seen every day for a full hour. And I was getting what I had wanted. I was getting what I thought I had needed. <laughs> and I'm going on much too long. Suffice it to say that one of those things happened, and I don't any longer believe they're coincidences. Dr. Tebow, my doctor, who was the medical director there, was asked by a woman friend on, with whom he served on ser several boards if he would read a manuscript. She had a brother-in-law that had joined some queer kind of a group of the they were going to print a book and they wanted psychiatric opinion on the book. They didn't want anything in the book that would offend psychiatry or the clergy. And her brother-in-law knew that she was physically active and she might know a psychiatrist and asked her if she knew one whom she thought might read it. And she said, yes, she did. So uh, I was under threat at that point because I'd gotten drunk every now and then. And I was sent for by Dr. Tebow, and I thought, this is it. I'm all true. And I had nowhere else to go. It would be the end. And he was sick in bed, and he was propped up with pillows. And lying on the bed was this... It was a funny-looking book. It had red cardboard covers and the wire things like that. And it was typewriter-sized paper. It looked like, like a typed manuscript. That's what it was. Mulder Lift copy. He said, I just finished reading this book. It's written by a group of people like you. They seem to have found something. And it seems to be working. And I think maybe it would help you, and I want you to take it and read it. And I said, what's it called? And he held it open to me. And the name of it was Alcoholic Phenomenon. That's the funniest name I ever read. <laughs> he said, yes, isn't it? We laughed over the name. We thought that was funny. So I went off to read this book. And I went off walking on air. And I began reading it, and I got more and more excited because I discovered I had a name. You know, I never can understand or sympathize with people that stumble over the word alcoholic. I was so happy I had something that had a name, and it gave me a name. If you'd gone around for five, by this time it was more than five years, trying to find out what you had that was wrong and did it have a name, and it didn't have a name, you'd be glad to have a name too. So I like that name. And at any rate, I read it, and I didn't like all the capital letters. They were all G. And I'd outgrown that when I was 17. So I took it back to Dr. Chivo, and I said, it's too bad. It's not for me. And I said, yeah, you've been teaching me that uh, one of my problems is that I think I run my mind with my reason, and I don't. I'm led around by the nose by my emotions. And here you hand me something, which is a purely emotional solution, which looks to me like self-hypnotism. And you tell me this will be good for me? This is ridiculous. He said, well, maybe so. Read on a little. He handled it like a master. You'd have thought he'd been doing it all his life. And it took a long while, it took a couple of months, but he got me into that book. And I got into the book, and the thing the book called for happened, which was a crisis. And I was in this jam, and <coughs> nothing I could do about it except get murderously angry. There wasn't any answer, there wasn't any solution. Murdering somebody wasn't going to solve anything. So I was going to go into Costco and get two bottles and come back and show them. You know, I was going to 
You know, we're so remarkably intelligent, the alcoholics, <laughs> that when we really want to kill somebody, we pick up a hammer and we beat out our own brains. <laughs> Now, the hammer's usually a bottle, but that's just what we do. And we go on doing it the rest of our lives if we're not careful. Think of how you react when you get angry. It's one reason that that's not very good for us, that emotion, because of the damage we do ourselves, not anybody else. We're not even capable of anybody else but we sure can mess ourselves up. Well, it, that was really... I had what Dr. Tebow assured me, because it scared the life out of me, was an authentic spiritual experience as the result of that crisis. And I was so frightened, I thought, now I really have gone off my rock. And now, he said, you go back upstairs and read that book. Well, I went back upstairs to read that book and somebody quit hooked. I picked up a book I had never seen before. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. I loved it. I read race through it. Mind you, I hadn't read a page in a week. You know, I went so slowly and so picky. And uh, it made complete sense to me and I loved it dearly and... So everything was solved. That was it. And then he said, they have meetings. <clears throat> and they're in New York. They're in Brooklyn. And I want you to go into a meeting. Oh my God, you know. I couldn't do that. I... I couldn't walk into a, a place full of strange people without a drink. I hadn't done that my whole life since I was 17. <laughs> I couldn't do it. And I told him I couldn't do that. So he played it, played me like a fish. And uh, I walked in one afternoon from my appointment and he picked up the phone and uh, he said, yes, she'll be on the such and such a train and she will come straight to your apartment and she'll be there about 6.30. You take her to me. Now, I had a mental picture that I think most alcoholics do before they ever get to a meeting and I don't care where they come from. I had a mental picture of a whole lot of skid row sticks. <laughs> who would be sitting around like praying mantises, praying over me. <laughs> it's a fine combination, I tell you. They weren't clerics. No, they were skid row tips, bums. <laughs> I couldn't, I just couldn't go to that. I couldn't do that. But he said, you're going to get such and such a train and you're going to such and such an address and he handed me a card and I just went out like a good looking girl and did just what I was told and I went. The first thing that I think made it possible was the address I was to go to was on Sutton Place. And this was an awful shock. I, this is not what I expected. So I went to this address on Sutton Place and uh, the husband and wife who lived there had a, uh, the handsomest young man I had ever seen in my life was there for my partner. A black Irishman. Curly, black curly hair and very blue eyes. He was the only other person besides me under 40 in the whole group. And he wasn't much under. <coughs> we got on the subway after dinner to go to Brooklyn and there we began to see a few of what I'd expected. From men in pretty much in rags and tatters with paper bags under their arms on the way to the meeting from Mills Hotel they lived and we got to the meeting and I looked in and looked this was a, one of those double living rooms an old brownstone you know and it looked absolutely packed to me I, I never saw so many people and I went upstairs to leave my coat and I didn't come down and pretty soon a a perfectly charming looking woman came up to me and she said, Marty, we're waiting for you downstairs. We want you. 
and everybody knows you're coming. We've been waiting for you for a long while. I think you better come downstairs. And she took me by the arm and took me downstairs, introduced me to two or three of these men. And in two minutes, I was talking to them as if I had known them from birth. For instance, I had done my little drinking out and off as I went in and out from town, which I was allowed to do. And uh, I was under warning, and again, I'd have to go. And this, naturally, I hadn't stopped, and uh, I couldn't. They asked me, several of them, when did you have your last drink? And without even thinking, I told them the truth. And then I thought, what did I do that for? <laughs> anyway, uh, I was deep in conversation with all of them, as if I'd known them all forever. And I suddenly realized that I had not had a drink, I hadn't had anything to ease my way. I felt completely comfortable in this room full of total strangers. I didn't think they were total strangers at all. They didn't feel that way to me. And furthermore, I belonged there. I had come home. I had found my peace. First time in my life. And that was the beginning of AA for me. It began with the fellowship part, really, except I'd read the book. By that time, you see, it was quite a while before I got to that meeting, I had read the book five or six times. I knew big chunks of it by heart. And we went upstairs, a few of us, after the meeting, and uh, where I, I was asking questions. We all were. I was asking Bill some questions. And I asked him about fifth or sixth question I asked, he looked at me, and this was, this one meeting a week, which was all we had, was on a Tuesday night, and Bill looked at me and he said, uh, you know, Marty, you can't do it all by Thursday. I was going to do it all by Thursday. I began to learn right then some of the basic lessons of AA, which was, was a matter of growth, that it was slow, that you had to keep at it, I'd heard quite a lot of things other people had said. I had recognized many great similarities in, in my experiences and theirs and my feelings and theirs. And uh, with no trouble at all, I was expressing my feelings and, uh, as they were to me. And, uh, even in that short time, that one night, I, I, got, I got a grasp. And, and what this was all about and what it could mean and what it could do and remember I had a little background from the spiritual experience and the reading of the book but it's gone on like that uh, I used to say sometimes when I was speaking that uh, I was got into AA by fall whole thing, the big frog. I came here for drink, to do something about my drink, preferably to learn how to control it. That was the real thing, I think. <coughs> but to do something about it so it would stop bugging me the way it was. And I ended up discovering that the AA had nothing whatever to do with drinking beyond stopping and saying stuff. AA had to do with me as a person. And I realized that the word alcohol is mentioned only once in the steps, first step, and that all the other steps are about what kind of a person are you? What kind of a person do you want to be? What are your relationships with other people, with your maker, with the world? It was a whole new life. A whole new life. Totally different from any other kind of life I'd ever heard about, observed, or read about. Because it hadn't been written up then, except in books, the big books. And I've gone on to be more and more convinced that's what AA is. 
many of you have heard me say that uh, I don't think of it as a program, what we all call it, but I think of it as a process. It is an ongoing process that will go on as long as we live. We'll never finish with it because there is no finish to it. It's a process of growth. And once you accept AA and you begin to try to follow those steps, you begin to grow. And growth is never a comfortable, steady thing. There's a lot of pain in it. There's a lot of ups and downs in it. There's a lot of flat places in it. But it keeps going. And you keep growing. And as you grow, you change change in many ways. And I think that will go on if you live to be 150 or 200 or however long Methuselah lives. I don't think it'll ever change. And for me at least, and mine hasn't been all smooth or all easy, it is a constant challenge. There's always something new to be learned or something new to be done better than I did it before, if possible. I found the chance, challenge of wanting to be, well, changing from a perfectionist, which is an unrealistic thing, to wanting to be better than I could be. That's all. And I don't think much what I could be, so that is just such a hard goal. <laughs> but that's what AA is to me, and it's, uh, I have found it as effective in meeting every other problem in my life as I found it effective in meeting the drinking. It still works the same way, no matter what it is you're coping with, whether it's another person, whether it's a situation, whether it's something that's happened to you, whatever it is, it'll help you cope with it without going down the drain. It'll help you cope with it without breaking in two. It'll help you grow. And as long as you're still growing, life at least is terrible. And sometimes it's very, very good. And when I'm sitting in a room like this, for most of the people I know and love, please stop and just say one thing. It makes me realize all over again something I told us a sponsee I was working on once. She said, Marty, can you tell me in one word, or maybe two, just what AA is? And I said, yes, I can. It's love. And that's what it is to me. Thanks.